<clears throat> Let me pray. Father, we're so mindful that we have a God that, that knows everything about us. The Lord, you understand us. You know our down sittings. You know our uprisings. And Father, we can come before you with, with the deepest hurt and, and understand, Lord, that you can bring healing. And so that's what we want to look at today, Father, just how it is that you do restore our hearts in, in, in that hurt that we sometimes find us in. So have your way this day, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Understand, folks, everyone hurts. Every single one of us hurt. Everyone gets hurt. Everyone, you know, experiences hurt, but nothing hurts us more than people. In fact, people cause more hurt, and that hurt causes more stress in our lives than anything. And, you know, people, the, the reality is people can be our greatest source of happiness or our greatest source of hurtfulness. And, and, and sometimes the hurt is unintentional, but the reality is that sometimes that hurt is indeed intentional. It's on purpose. But all of us, at some point in time, have been hurt. And it's not so much the hurt that we experience, but rather how we handle that hurt when we are hurt. Now, let me ask you something. How do you respond? How do you respond when somebody hurts you? Uh, how, do you how do you handle it? I want to give you five things not to do this morning and not... Um, things that you, you wouldn't want to do when you're hurting. Five things, and the first one is don't ignore it. That's, that's kind of a John Wayne machoism kind of thing that, you know, it, it can just end up to coming back and hurting us even more. We just, we, we kind of ignore it and pretend it isn't there. Oh, I got this. I can handle it. It's not really there. It's no big deal. I'm not going to have to deal with it. And as a result, we ignore it. And we ignore it in several ways. First of all, we deny it. We say, oh, it's, it's, it's not there. There's, there's nothing really there. Or we try and, and minimize it and just say, you know, it's no big deal. It, it's nothing. It's, it's small. Small potatoes. Or we try and procrastinate. In other words, we try and put off dealing with it. But you know what? You can't do that because it's always going to be there when we come back. Ignoring your hurt will not heal your hurt. Listen to what David says in Psalm 39 and verse 2. He says, I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred up. He's saying that as long as I was silent about it, as long as I didn't, you know, make mention of it and, and deal with it, it seemed to get worse. It was stirred up. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. But then the second thing is, don't try and run from it. You see, if the first one was the John Wayne approach, this one is the Barney Fife approach. This is the shakiest gun in the, in the West, you know, Mr. Chicken. <coughs> and um, listen to what David says in Psalm 55 and verse 6. And I think that we've all felt like this at some point in time. He says, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. He goes on to say, indeed, I would... Wander far off and remain in the wilderness, Selah. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. And I don't know about you, but have you ever seen a, a jet go by overhead or maybe just a plane go by overhead and you look up and you think, oh, I wish I was on that. Man, I, I just need to escape today. I wish I could get away today. And that's what David is saying here. It, it, it's... Um, it's okay to feel that way, but the hurt's still going to be there when you get back. It's not so much the hurt that, that, that it, it's dealing with it. It's all about how we approach it. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I think that the world we live in really feeds 
to the problem. It feeds into the problem. You know, we, we run away from hurt in so many ways. I mean, look at the movies. Look at television. Look at the internet. Look at Facebook. People spend hours and hours. And, and really, it's a means of escape. What about shopping? The desire to the to acquire, you know, there, there are all kinds of different ways that we, we attempt to escape, but the reality is that hurt is going to be there when we get back. You can't ignore it, you can't run from it, and you can't hide it. You cannot hide it. Now, if you understand this. Some people wear a mask, and I'm looking at a bunch of people wearing masks today. But what I'm talking about is they put on a facade, and they pretend, oh, it's all good, and, and they come to church, and, 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 and a lot of times they, I, I don't know any other way to say this, but they look like they've been baptized in pickle juice and sucking on a lemon. Because they're just dour, they're down in the dumps, and, and, and they're just there, you know? And you say, is everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine, I'm okay. Is, are you sure, is everything okay? And, and they just say, yeah, it's okay, I'm okay, I'll be all right, it's okay. And they, they just try and mask it up, wear a facade. I want you to listen to what James says in chapter 5, verse 16. He says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Don't gossip about it. It's, not, it's praying to one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervor and prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You see, we need to be able to open up to folks. We need to be able to share our heart because the reality is that some of us have deep hurts in our life and we need to be able to have Christian brothers and sisters that have our back. That, that we're not going to be judged and, and, you know, we should be able to come in here into this place and, and pray and share and come alongside one another and, and do that. And, and, you know, part of that is so that we, we, we can deal with our hurts. And then the fourth thing is don't worry about it. Now... This is something we all like to do. We like to worry. You know the worry is a control situation. It's a control issue. You know, if we worry about it, then we're not putting it in God's hands. We think that we can control it. Worry. Don't worry. Worry does two things. It, first of all, intensifies the hurt, but it also magnifies the problem, makes it seem bigger than it really is. Don't worry about it. And finally, don't resent it. Don't resent it. You know, sometimes when we hurt, we, we turn that hurt into resentment. And then the resentment becomes a bitterness. And then bitterness becomes an anger that, that is stirred up inside of us. And, and, and then that anger turns into self-pity. And we get this silly notion in our heads that if I you know, resent somebody, that resentment is going to hurt them. Uh, no, not at all. Let, let me say it this way. The resentment you feel towards someone who has hurt you will cause you more hurt than the hurt did initially. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The resentment you feel towards someone who has hurt you will cause you more hurt than the original hurt that they caused you in the first place. So, don't resent it. Don't resent it. And these are five things that we don't want to do when we're hurt. When we're really, really, you know, need help, need healing when we're hurt. Okay, so these are the five things we don't want to do. Let me give you some things that we do want to do. We're going to take it right out of the scripture, right out of our verse this morning, where... where um, David says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. This is verse 5. My cup runs over. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In this verse, David gives us three 
very practical steps that we can incorporate into our lives and our heart, apply them to our lives to help us deal with the hurt in our lives. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over or it overflows. Now, when we've experienced the hurt and the pain in life, we need practical application to get by. And David gives us these three steps that we need to follow to begin to heal the hurt. Here's the first one. Allow God time and opportunity. Now, let me explain. Allow God time, that's his time, and allow him opportunity. And every one of us, as I said, have been hurt before. All of us have been hurt. We've, you know, had something happen and we haven't given God the opportunity to really, really do something about that hurt. But we need to give him the time and the opportunity to settle the issues that cause the hurt in your life. And David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, remember, David is a shepherd. He's a shepherd, but the reality is he never gets away from that, even though he becomes a great king. He becomes an amazing administrator. He's a, a, a great warrior and a politician but he's still a shepherd. He still has that shepherd's heart. And when a shepherd would take his sheep into a new area, he would always go in ahead of his sheep and scope it out and check it out. Remember, sheep are led. Cattle are driven, but sheep are led. I remember my pastor telling me this many, many years ago when I first got into ministry. He said, you need to remember this above all, that you cannot pull sheep, you cannot push them, you lead them. You lead them. And I've never forgotten that. David knew that. So as he came to this new pasture, this new area where he's going to have his sheep fed, he would go in first and it was so that he could remove any impediments and, and see if there was any predators or or." Um, dangers in there for the sheep and he would take that cruise of oil and he would pour it down snake holes so that the snakes couldn't get up the hole and bite the sheep when they were feeding he would prepare that place for them and that's what he's saying here that God has done the preparation ahead of time now can you imagine what it's going to be like to sit at that banquet table that the Lord has prepared in heaven in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them who love him. Can you imagine what that banquet table is going to be like? But he says, not only has the Lord prepared this table for me, but he's done it in the presence of my enemies. Remember, after David had killed Goliath, they came back and they had a feast at Saul's table and the women sang a song about Saul that he had killed his thousand, but David had killed his tens of thousands. And the Bible says from that point on, Saul looked at David with suspicion. With suspicion, he became David's enemy. And yet David sat at Saul's table and we know it from later on in scripture when it says that David's seat was empty. So he had a seat at Saul's table in the presence of his enemy. But even David didn't know it at the time. But when he looked back, when he, when he looked back to that situation, he, he remembered that while he was there in the presence of his enemies, the Lord had prepared the place. You see, David learned that principle at that time, he learned that if, and, and if you don't get anything else out of what I'm going to say this morning, get this. Let God fight your battles. Let God fight your battles. David was just a lad when he took on Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. He was just, just a lad. And he goes up to Goliath and he says, you come out here with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord. But now listen to verse 47. 
of 1 Samuel 17, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. You see, that's the lesson we have to understand. It's the Lord's battle. That's the principle that David learned as a, as a young lad. And, and it stayed with him throughout his life. Further on in 2 Samuel chapter 5, it says, Therefore, David, let me give you a little background here. David's going up to battle against the Philistines. And he's seeking the Lord. Lord, what would you have me do? Where, how do I deal with this? And the Lord, David inquired of the Lord and he said, you shall not go up, circle around behind them, and then come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he drove the, back the Philistines from Gebet to as far as Gezer. So, it's like a, a sonic boom. The Lord says, when you hear this sound in the treetops, and where are you ever going to hear of an army marching in the treetops, right? It's an army of the Lord, of course. And he wow. says, when you hear this sound in the treetops, it's already going to have happened. It's like a sonic boom. By the time we hear it, it's already happened. We need to learn that principle. Let God fight your battles. In Exodus 14, Moses explains the same principle to us. He explains it to the children of Israel, but it's for us as well. They're at the Red Sea and the Egyptian army's closing in on them. And Moses says this in verse 14 of Exodus 14. He says, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. He says, just chill out. God's got this. God's got this. Just, just be quiet and let the Lord handle it. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28, the Lord tells us to do four things with our enemies. Four things. Actually, Chris and I talked about this this morning. There are four things that we are to do with our enemies. First of all, love them. Secondly, pray for them. Then bless them. And do good to them. Paul tells us the same thing over in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, when he says, never take your own revenge. Leave room for the wrath of God. In other words, let God fight your battles. You see, from Moses to Jesus to Paul, they all say the same thing. Don't fight your battles. Let the Lord do it for you. And we need to understand that uh, this this is very important. We need to understand that God loves our enemies as much as he loves us. He loves our enemies as much as he loves you and I. And that's hard to deal with when that person has 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 really hurt you. You know, they've, they've used you, they've lied about you, talked about you, mistreated you in some way. That's hard to get your head around. But he loves them. As much as he loves you and I, he died for them the same as he died for you and I. And what David is saying, if you let him, if you let the Lord, he will within eye shot and earshot of your enemies pour out his blessing into your life. He will pour his life, his blessing into your life. You know, I, 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 I am so thankful that I learned that lesson a long time ago. And I learned it the hard way. But I learned it a long time ago, and most of the time, most of the time, I can let God fight my battles, and when I do, it turns out so much better. Give him time. Give him opportunity. Give him those things to, to soothe the hurts, to settle the issues in your life. But now the second thing is, Allow God time and opportunity to soothe those hurts. Now, we, we see this back to verse 5 in, in Psalm 23. He says, you anoint my head with oil. Now, a shepherd would mix sulfur up with oil, and that was medication in, in Bible days. And uh, he would take that oil and he would anoint the head's ears and the, the, the sheep's 
head and its ears and its nose and, and rub all of this oil into it. And um, he did it for two reasons. Now, I hope that your breakfast is settled because one of them isn't so pleasant. He did it, first of all, to heal their hurts, <coughs> to heal their wounds because flies are a terrible frustration to sheep. Flies. They're a terrible frustration to me. I think when I get to heaven, I want to ask the Lord, why didn't you just swat that fly in the ark? You know? But, but they are. They're, they're a terrible frustration. But to a sheep, they can be just, just relentless because, remember, they got these little wee They can't swat them away. They don't have a tail like a horse or a cow. They can't swish it away. But um, it drives the sheep crazy and, and sheep have been known to bang their head against a rock because the frustration of not being able to to do anything about it and and so the shepherd would come and they'd rub this oil on the head of the sheep and the nose and the ears on the head and it'd be like it'd be like um skin so soft you ever use skin so soft against the mosquitoes and the bugs or or off you know much more soothing than off, but, but that's what the shepherd would do. I wonder how many of us are bothered by all those little frustrations of life. You know, I am. I am. You know, it's, it's not the 16-foot shark that's swimming around out there. It's all those little piranhas that, that seem to be hovering around, you know, and, and um, they bring the frustrations of life. But God says, I can deal with that. I can take all of that away. I can deal with the hurts in your life. And he does it, first of all, to heal. But he does it, secondly, to soothe their wounds. Now listen to Psalm 147, verse 3. He says, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. That word in the Greek, wounds, is sorrows. He binds up their sorrows. And that's exactly what God wants to do with you and I. He wants to take those hurts and he wants to bind them up. Now, this is what we do as Christians. We get hurt and we know that we are supposed to forgive. We know that. And we know that if we forgive them, we're going to experience the healing, right? No. Wrong. Wrong. It does not work that way. Forgiveness is right now. We can forgive right now, but sometimes the hurt takes healing, and sometimes the healing takes time. And there may be someone here, maybe in, in earshot somewhere, some that 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 maybe have gone through a painful divorce, or 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 maybe there's you know uh, something that you've gone through. I tell you what, there's nothing fun about that kind of thing. Maybe someone has had an abortion or, or you know, the guilt that comes along with that that you deal with is, is just painful. It's painful. Maybe you've had a parent that rejected you or neglected you or, or never really accepted you. But the fact is that maybe somebody here has been hurt as a child and you never really get over that like that. It doesn't happen that way. Just because you've forgiven them doesn't mean instant healing. Sometimes it takes days. Sometimes it takes weeks, months, longer. You need to give God the opportunity. You need to give him time and opportunity to heal you. The Lord uses four things when it comes to that to heal us. Probably a lot more, but four that I'm going to share with you right now. And the first thing he uses is fellowship. Now understand, this time that we gather together on Sunday morning is for the teaching and preaching of the word, the apostles' doctrine and creed. This is fellowship to be together, but this isn't the time when you can get your questions answered. It's not a time when you can, you know, it's, it's an interactive service. This is a time for the teaching of the word. We have Bible study, we have small groups, we have things, that, that uh, hospitality that we can use for those things. But God uses uh, fellowship. The second thing he uses is prayer. Prayer. You know, we need to be able to talk it out 
with the Lord. We, we need to understand that we can go to him and tell him exactly how we feel. Now listen to this. If you don't talk it through with the Lord, you'll take it out on yourself or somebody else. If you go home today and just kind of casually read through the Psalms, David tells God exactly how he's feeling. He tells him, God, you know, I, I just feel like I'm going to fall. I don't understand, God, why the wicked prosper and, and the righteous suffer. I don't understand that, God. Why is that? You know, why don't you zap my enemies? You see, we have a big God, and we can come toe-to-toe -to -toe with the God of all there is and, and talk to him like that. And we do it in prayer, and God will use prayer to help heal us. He uses worship, and I'll tell you what. The Lord will use this time of, of, of worship when we are really desiring to see him high and lifted up in our lives and in our, our church. And that's why he says, don't, for, don't forsake the assembling of the, yourselves together as the manner of some is. Don't miss church. This is where we come together for worship. And then finally, ministry. I can assure you that whatever it is that you've gone through, whatever has happened in your life, it's happened in somebody else's life. And God can use what you've been through and the healing that you've been through. He can use you to minister to somebody else going through the same thing. So now before we get to point number three, you need to understand two things. First of all, healing is a two-phase process. When... <laughs> When you come through surgery, they bring you out of the, the operating room, they put you in the room, and they hook you up to IV and, and monitors and everything because they want to get you stabilized. They want to see you stable, and they want to do it quickly. They want to get you stabilized quickly because the next thing they want to do is to send in physiotherapy to get you up walking, and you don't want to get up and walk. They come in there, and they poke and prod and pull, and, and, and you know, bring you to submission and you don't want to get up and walk all you want to do is lay there because you hurt and some of us don't like it when the preacher stands up here and says it's time for you to get up and do something you got to let go of those things that the enemy has you buried with you got to deal with it you need to get up you see we don't like to get up we don't want to get up we don't want to stop this this self-pity that we find ourselves in and get to that second phase of healing, which is doing something for someone else because when you're doing it for them, you're doing it really, you're doing it for the Lord, but it's you that gains from that. But there's another thing that happens. Now listen to this. That's the scar. That's the scar. Now, if you've ever had an operation, there's a scar. And, you know, you, you've, if you've been through a divorce, there's a scar. If you've been through a broken relationship, there's a scar. And, and there's a couple of things that you can do with that scar. The first thing is you can relive the experience. You ever gone into a hospital room where somebody's had an operation, first thing you want to do is show you the scar? I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. But they want to show you the scar, and, and, and they, they, they want to relive that whole experience. But every time you look at that scar, you can relive the experience and the bitterness and the hurt. Or the second thing is, you can look at that scar and recall the healing. You see, the choice is ours. We can use that as a trophy of God's grace, a picture of his grace in his life, how he, he used it to heal us. Dennis, please, just, I know you went, just went through it, brother, but just let me get through this, okay, please? You see, every time you see the scar, every time you can forget that hurt, you can forget it, and recall the blessing of God in your life as a result of it. So the first thing is that we need to allow God the time and opportunity. Secondly, we need to allow him time and opportunity to soothe our hurts, 
But the third thing is we need to allow him time and opportunity to satisfy the needs in your life, to satisfy the needs in your life. And he says, my cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. Pure and simple, what that means is satisfaction. I am satisfied. My cup is overflowing. I am satisfied. Let me tell you this straight. The only one who can ever meet the deepest needs of your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And the reason why we hurt so much is because we look to people to do those things for us that only God can do. We look to people to meet those needs in our life that only God can meet. You know, no person can do that. No person can love you unconditionally all the time, everywhere, in every situation. No person can give you the stability that God can all the time. And, and maybe there's someone here that's listening who's, whose marriage is in trouble because maybe you're expecting your mate to meet needs in your life that God never intended for them to meet. You know what happens? You frustrate them and you frustrate yourself. You demoralize yourself. You see, it is wrong for me to depend on Chris to always, always make me happy. Make me happy. It's unfair for me to expect my wife to do for things, do the things for me that only God can do. Only God can do. It's unfair to her. It's unfair to look at an employer, you know, as an employee or to a friend or whatever, because only God can satisfy the deepest needs of your life. And he does it in three ways. Now, Romans 15 and verse 13 says, the God of all hope will fill you. He fills us with hope. Then over in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12, it says, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another. He fills us with love to the point of abounding. And then the third thing, ask, Jesus says, and you will receive that your joy may be full. You see, he says, I will take your cup, the cup of life that you have in front of you, and I will pour out my love, my joy, my peace into your life, into your, um, <coughs> in, into your entire situation. And that's how he heals our hurts. Now, the Bedouins who lived about um, in the time of David, they lived in the desert and moved about the desert in the time of David and still do in our day, the Bedouins practice as great a hospitality as any that we've ever, ever seen in the world. Um, if you were uh, traveling in the desert and, and, um, and, and came to a Bedouin camp, a Bedouin tent, as these people have, they invite you to come in and they will give you water. Remember, you're in a dry, dry situation and, and they want to offer you a cup of water. Now, water is a very, very precious commodity in the desert. I mean, far more precious than gold and silver if you're dying of thirst. But if you were a guest of the Bedouins, they would take that cup and they, they fill it up and you drink it down and you put the cup down. If they wanted you to stay, they would refill it. If they didn't want you to stay and it was time for you to end your visit and move on, they wouldn't fill it again. But if they really wanted you to know that you were welcome to all that they had, to everything that they had, they would fill that cup until it splashed out, spilt over. You see, if you really want to know how much we want you to be with us, then, then understand my cup runs over. And so the Lord comes to us and he sets this cup of life in front of us and he pours out his joy. He pours out his hope. He pours out his life, love into our cup. And, but he doesn't just fill it. He fills it to the point that it splashes out and over so that we can take that love joy and, and, and share it with others. That we can share that hope of his presence with others. We have that blessed hope. 
And, um, you know, I know that there are people here today that hurt. Some people try to ignore it. Some people are trying to, to run from it. Some people may be wearing a facade, a mask, trying to hide it. But none of that, none of that will heal those hurts. Only, only coming to him and allowing him time and opportunity will allow him to heal the, those hurts. And today he's saying, come, sit at my table. Let me, let me settle this issue in your life. I'll soothe it. I'll soothe that hurt and those issues and I'll satisfy you. I'll settle it. I'll soothe it and I'll satisfy you. I don't know where you are today, but I want you to know that Jesus is right here, right now. And he says to each one of us, come. So if you need prayer today, if you want to, if you want to uh, do business with God, Camilla's going to come and we're going to sing and, and, um, and then I'm going to pray and I'm going to pronounce a benediction. Dennis? Yes, uh, God can turn your scars into stars. Amen. That's right. God can turn your scars into stars. That's right. Thank you. And let me just pray for a second. Father, I thank you now for your word, and I thank you that we have a God who is, is so involved in our lives that you are, are, are just aware of every situation. You're aware of every word spoken by us, to us. And Father, I pray that you would take us and, and help us get through those things that have hurt us those things that we need to deal with, Lord. I pray that you would strengthen us in the power of your might. So have your way, I pray this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Near to the heart of God, let's stand and sing. Close in prayer, please.